You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Today we are joined by Sarah Ellis. Sarah is the co-founder of Amazing If, an award-winning career development company with a mission to make work better for everyone. She is the host of the UK's number one careers podcast, Squiggly Careers, and co-author of the Sunday Times number one business bestseller, The Squiggly Career, Ditch the Ladder, Discover Opportunity, Design Your Career, which we'll be discussing today. Sarah, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, so am I, to be fair. I think the last 18 months has been a very interesting time for many people uh, with redesigning their own career, uh, me included. <laughs> so uh, reading the book, actually, my mum suggested that I read the book. Uh, oh. This is how I, how I actually came uh, came across it. So I have to shout out mum for the recommendation. Oh, thank you to your mum. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, she gives me many great book recommendations, to be fair. So I um, appreciate mum on that one. So before we get into some of the details about Squiggly Career and how we can go about establishing that for ourselves, um, I think it'd be great uh, for you to just discuss uh, how you came about Squiggly Career and, and, and the concept behind it. Yeah, of course. Um, it certainly wasn't an amazing master plan that I can claim any credit for. I think it was more you know, we'd been, I'd been in really big organisations and did feel like I was climbing the ladder. You know, even now when we see people talk about careers, that ladder-like analogy is still used quite frequently. And that actually did feel like my reality for quite a long time. I was in really large organisations. It felt like success was very much about climbing the rungs of the ladder. That's what we should all be doing. That that should be the thing that should matter most to us at work. And if we weren't doing that, we weren't succeeding. And over time, I think I started to just feel like this ladder didn't really reflect either my experiences of work or my aspirations for the future. And it wasn't just me. It was the teams that I was leading, uh, the organisations that I was part of, all started to feel like They weren't as linear and as predictable that actually there was so much change and uncertainty consistently. This is not about the future of work. This was about in the here and now. It didn't feel like there was only kind of one path. And the the good news, I think, was that there felt like there was less pressure to be following in other people's footsteps and perhaps more opportunity to figure out, well, what did you want to do? Like, where, where did you want to go? What felt meaningful and motivating for you? And it was honestly as simple as Helen and I, uh, Helen's my co-founder, we were just chatting in a kind of cliche coffee shop one day. And I did that thing of like drawing on a napkin. And I just said to her, I was like, I don't feel it's about these like ladders or steps anymore. And I drew a squiggle and I just said, feels just squiggly, doesn't it? Just feels squiggly. We're developing in different directions. We're going to have four or five different types of career. Who knows? Who knows what it's going to look like? And it wasn't like we had a massive aha moment. I didn't at that moment go, amazing, I've got this incredible <laughs> idea. All we just went was, yeah, that feels more right. Squiggly feels more right than climbing a ladder. And we just started to share this idea of ladders versus squiggles at the start of all of our workshops and all the work we were doing with organisations. And what we found was as soon as we shared that, everyone was like, oh, you've just given me a way of describing like what I'm feeling. I think that's what people needed. I don't think we have created something that wasn't there before. I think what we've done is created a way of talking about our careers that just feels much more useful and a better starting point to think then about, well, how do we design our careers? Um, Also, what are the challenges of squiggly careers? They're not, it's not like we're saying they're brilliant all of the time. I think they are overwhelming. They're stressful. They have knotty moments. So that's really where it came from. It came from a napkin in a cafe and then just starting to talk to people about it and realising it really stuck. It just felt like it was really memorable for people. Sure. (laughs) It feels like you should be taking more credit for it, to be fair. (laughs) (laughs) If it it was like a a Picasso moment on the uh, Uh. in the in the the coffee shop on 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 the uh, on the napkin. So, yeah, no, definitely. I definitely think that 
I think it's reframing it. I think mm. changing from the ladder into the into the the squiggly career or the or the squiggly line, I think is resonates with a lot of people. So I can definitely see that being um, something that organisations and individuals would definitely um, connect to. So what what do you think think are some of the the common pitfalls um, that many people make when designing their career, whether it be squiggly or otherwise, because I think a lot of people have this vision about what they want their career to be, but it might change in time. Mm. Well, I think it's a, that's a great a great question. I think probably some of it has also been a bit impacted by the past 18 months or so. Mm. But I think the first thing when we're thinking about careers and like where we want to go and kind of what we want to do, what we're not saying with squiggly careers is, oh, um, you know, everything goes out the window. You almost just need to be so spontaneous and go with the flow. I'm I'm not like that as a person. I'm a, I'm a planned person. I'm very future focused. I really like to think about, you know, where I'd like to go, what goals I've got, all that kind of good stuff. I think the thing that I would encourage people to do is move away from one plan. This idea of I've got one plan that I'm trying to follow and instead focus more on exploring possibilities And by exploring possibilities, it means that you know which directions, plural, you're kind of interested in exploring. You're actively thinking about, well, am I building the right connections? Am I learning the right things to keep exploring those things? And you stay really open minded about, you know, maybe exactly what that might look like. So it's less about job titles or exact roles, because to be honest, within a couple of years, those job titles might not exist anymore, or those organisations might look and feel really different. So if we anchor ourselves to, it has to look exactly like this, a real kind of blueprint, I think it actually makes us really vulnerable in our careers, it makes us less resilient. So I think that's a kind of mindset point. And I think the other thing that I think is a really good place to start is moving away from feeling like we need to have a one size fits all uh, version of success or way of thinking about our careers. And I do think probably comparing our careers to each other is easier than probably it ever has been. Even like compare, if I think about comparing my career in the first 10 years, it, you know, social media didn't exist in the way that it does today. Mm. And so you kind of had an awareness of what maybe some of your friends were doing or some of your peers. But now I think people can put an awful lot of pressure on themselves because they maybe look around at other people and think, well, why am I not doing that? Or that person seems to be ahead in kind of quote unquote yeah. ahead of me. They seem to be more successful than me. And there's a few things there. I think the, the first thing is remembering that on social media generally, in the main, people are sharing the shiny moments, as I describe them. They're sharing the successes. They're sharing them at their best. You don't often see lots of kind of what's happening under the surface so it's always kind of worth worth remembering that though I do think some people increasingly are doing a really good job of you know showing all of the ins and the outs and and we try we try to do that and sometimes I still spot that we do it you know you're you're everything perhaps looks like you've got these incredible photography and everything's brilliant and they don't see the really boring moments where you're doing invoices and where you're doing the excel spreadsheets because it doesn't make for a great picture on Instagram. Um, so I think no, no one wants to see the invoices. Yeah, no one wants to see that. No one wants to see my spreadsheets that, according to my accountancy boyfriend, are not very good. So um, I think that's one thing. And then I think the other thing is it does take real confidence to figure out, like, well, what do I want my squiggle to look like? What you're kind of feeling like you're in control and having the confidence to feel like, well, I know that this is the right squiggle for me at the moment. I know, you know, what my values are. I know what my strengths are. And the thing that I see consistently with people who are making their most of their squiggly careers, who are enjoying what they're doing in the here and now and in the present, pretty much without exception, those people are using their strengths. So doing the things that they enjoy and that give them energy and stretching those strengths in different direction. Mm -hmm. And they are living their values, the things that really motivate and drive them. And that's almost that's so easy to say, and it's yeah. it's really hard to do. Yeah, and and in the book you talk about defining strengths as being natural talents plus experiences, and you you talk about four step process defining your strengths. Mm-hmm. And I think as people, human beings, we're very very critical of ourselves in the sense that we are very easy to find our weaknesses. But we we often when someone asks what you're good at, you almost sort of deliberate. For, for many minutes to try and think what you're good at. But when you think about what you're bad at, oh my God, you can list out 10 yeah. things within within 10 seconds. <laughs> so 
can you just talk about those four yeah. um, st- uh, step process to, to finding your strengths and, and how someone can go about doing that? Of course. So I think, first of all, we often are our own worst critics. And that's because, and we should give ourselves a break, we all have a natural negativity bias. All of our brains have what's called a negativity bias. And all that means is that our brains are better at remembering and recalling and processing the mistakes that we've made, the things that have not gone to plan. Which we're just better at that. And we the reason our brains do that is obviously it helps us to survive. It's the kind of the primal, we need survival instinct kicking in. So the first thing I would always say to people, if you're struggling to see your strengths or to spot your strengths, often other people can do a much better job on our behalf than we can do. And I think the single best exercise that you can do in terms of your strengths is asking as many people as possible this exact same question. What three words would you use to describe me at my best? Really simple question. It's simple, it's quick, and it's really easy. You can do it on WhatsApp. You can do it in an email. You can do it on messaging. You can do it in person. Sometimes people need a bit of time to think about it. But most of the time, you're what you'll find and asking, you can ask friends, you can ask family, people you work with today, people you've worked with in the past, and just get all of those words, kind of collect all of those words and, and see what happens. A few things we observe when people do this. Sometimes people are surprised just because we've not seen those things. And often that surprise comes from, we don't give ourselves credit for exactly what you said, what we call your natural talents. So If you're naturally really thoughtful or you're someone who's a brilliant listener, you just sort of take that for granted and then often think, oh, but everybody's good at that. So we dismiss that thing that we're good at really quickly. And so when you start to get lots of feedback and you see people saying, oh, you're really caring, you're really thoughtful, people might use slightly different words, it kind of forces you to embrace those things that we are really good at. So sometimes we're surprised and and the thing that I'd really um, recommend if people do this is don't dismiss what people are telling you, but try and try and believe it. Believe that those people are, you know, telling you the truth, that what they can see in you is what you've got to give. So that's that can be really useful. And then often what the other thing that really happens is when we ask lots of people for that strengths based feedback, it helps us to quieten our inner critic. And that inner critic is kind of that negativity bias. And it's what it's the stories that we tell ourselves. And we all have that kind of inner monologue running, don't we? That goes, I'm not good enough or I don't I'm really worried about failing. or I just don't think I can do that. And that's, again, really natural. We all have that kind of more critical self-talk. And if we get this strengths based feedback from people, it just helps to kind of quieten that critic. And we call it kind of you put your inner coach in charge instead. You're, and your inner coach who doesn't doesn't you're not trying to pretend you're perfect because none of us are. But it does see your potential and it does see you in a balanced way. And it sees what you've got to give and all your positives. And it just gives you then that confidence to think about, well, am I using those strengths as much as I would like to? Am I making sure those strengths stand out and show up? And I think with strengths, I mean, like you said, we sort of describe it as a process, but never see strengths as like a tick box exercise. Mm -hmm. I think if we see that, especially with strengths where there's quite a few exercises that you can do that kind of spit out your strengths for you. I'm not suspicious of those, but I would just say be cautious because I feel like I want people to find what they feel like their strengths are for themselves. I think you choose your super strengths. You choose those things you want to be known for. You choose what you want people to say about you when you're not in the room. So make sure use all of those resources. Like you say, we give you a process. There's lots of other ones out there. Use all of that, but use it as inputs, not as outputs. And then really think about, I always think with strengths, there are three things you're trying to get to. Do I know my strengths? Am I actively growing the strengths that are most important to me? And am I making sure that those strengths stand out and show up everywhere that I am? And if you kind of really start to do that, that's when you you just find yourself more in flow more often. You find yourself doing more of your best work. You'll have more energy and you'll just get to the end of a week and think, was my time at work this week well spent? And it, yeah. the answer is much more likely to be yes if you're using your strengths much more frequently. On, on that point, do you recommend someone do exactly the same with their weaknesses? Um. No, not normally, because people usually have 
uh, a much better view already of those weaknesses. What I think is okay. more interesting on weaknesses, because I think we can end up in this land of trying to do everything at once, or yep. like trying to spread ourselves too thinly. We're trying to make our strengths stronger and we're worrying about all of our weaknesses. And I spent a good 10 years of my career doing that. And, and that means you kind of end up being good, maybe very good, but probably never great in, in, in kind of my view. I think what's much more useful and realistic is thinking about what are the weaknesses that I need to work on so they don't hold me back from exploring the possibilities that I'm really interested in. Yep. So choose the weaknesses that you want to spend time on. And remember that your aim with your weaknesses is to get good enough and your aim with your strengths is to get great. So I think the, the kind of transformation for me in my career was when I accepted that as a reality where I sort of thought, rather than trying to be all things to all people, I'm going to have two or three things that I'm going to try and be great at, that I'm going to try and really build my reputation for, that I want to be known for, that I enjoy, that I want to do more of, I want to stretch these strengths. And I know I've got a couple of weaknesses that if I don't get a bit better, if I don't get good enough, they could get in my way. So yeah. I'm going to work on them to the extent of just getting good enough. And then that's fine. I'll kind of, I'll leave them at that point. So I think just think about great and good enough. And I, I find that a useful framework to think about strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I think it's matching your strengths with the weaknesses and saying, okay, if I'm not very good at that specific weakness, but it's linked to one of your strengths that you want to improve on, then you know you have to improve mm. it. But if they're not correlated, then there's no point doing it because yeah. you're wasting your time. Is that, what, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that's a really good, that's a really good kind of build, I think, on what I was saying. So that point about going, well, if you, um, you know, to, to, for my experience now, I've moved away from working in really big organizations to running my own small company. So one of the things that I am great at is developing ideas, starting stuff from scratch. One of my weaknesses is finishing things. Now, I could... I can second that. Yeah, I'm great <laughs> at starting, I'm less good at finishing. Yep. And in a really, in actually in big companies where your roles are probably more specific, you can do roles which are based on mainly starting things and, and more strategic Whereas now I'm in a job that just has so much more variety because obviously you do have to do more when you're kind of running your own company, that there are some things that I definitely now know that if I'm going to be great at developing ideas in my current context, in the situation that, I, that you know, that I now work in, I have got to get good enough at finishing things because otherwise nothing will actually get done. <laughs> yeah. That was a that was a thing that I came across actually a couple of uh, months ago actually. So when I transitioned from my full time role into into what I'm doing now and and going through somewhat of a career change as I'm learning new skills, I came to the realization that I think this there might be an interesting point as well is how often do people come to you and say you know I feel like I'm a quitter I feel like I try things and they don't work out but I don't know whether it's me quitting or whether it's not you know in line with my strengths. What are the proportions between those two? Because I feel like a lot of the time for myself anyway, I have this dialogue that says, oh, I didn't do that and I feel like a quitter, whereas perhaps it might not have been to my strengths. Where is the relationship between that? Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's often kind of how you frame things not going to plan or or failure, if we kind of want to put it in more yeah. in more binary terms. And I think the thing that we hear the most actually is that when things don't go to plan and perhaps you try something out maybe that's a, as big as a career change or maybe that's volunteering for something or maybe it's just presenting when you get quite nervous presenting that can be on a whole spectrum of different examples yeah. if it then doesn't go well I think the impact that we see lots of people talk to us about is around confidence is people going that's really impacted my confidence and then the kind of stories that then we tell ourselves, the kind of beliefs, we call them confidence gremlins. These confidence gremlins that get in our way often grow when things don't go to plan. And we then start to tell ourselves um, what these kind of limiting beliefs like, I'm a failure, full stop. I can't do that. I'm a full stop. I tried this before and it didn't work. So I'm not going to try it again, full stop. Versus, and I'm sure you've talked about this before on the podcast, having more of what's called a growth mindset approach to failure or setbacks or things not going wrong, where you don't try and ignore and avoid 
um, what's happened because that is the reality. So Mm. I didn't get that job or that career change didn't work out. But your questions to yourself become less about, I am a failure, labelling yourself in that way, and become more about, and what did I learn? What would I do differently next time? Who could help me? Who could support me to think about this again? Um, I might not be able to do that yet, but believing that there might be another point in the future where you can make that happen. And it's really interesting, actually, I'll tell you a, a short story about Squiggly Career, which if you look at it now, looks quite shiny. You know, we were like, oh, it's a number one Sunday Times bestseller, looks brilliant. When we first went and spoke to publishers um, about the Squiggly Career, no one was interested. No one. Um, you know, we were knocking on lots of doors, couldn't get anyone to, yeah. people didn't really get it. And so Helen and I at that point could have really easily said, um, this is not a good idea. Uh, we're not writers. We're not credible in this area. I can I can come up with loads of confidence yeah. gremlins that m- could have really easily been reinforced at that moment because it was true. Like people didn't want to publish that book. People weren't interested in us writing a book. They weren't interested in the content of the book. So you know we were kind of like, okay, well that's quite a lot of data and evidence steering us towards doing something different. Whereas I think what our approach to it was at that time was thinking okay, well, it doesn't feel like we can't make this happen yet. So what what could we do in the meantime that help might help us to fill in some of the gaps that we know that we've got? How do we keep stress testing this idea that we really believe in? How do we start showing that there is the demand for this idea of squiggly careers and kind of designing your own career? Because it looks like what we need to be able to influence and persuade to make this book a reality, which we felt was a good idea is we were like okay we need to get more momentum behind this we need to try it out we just need to test it so our point of view there was okay well squiggly careers as a book is is not quite ready yet but we we still believed in the idea it just that it wasn't quite there wasn't obviously quite the right time and maybe we weren't at the right stage maybe we weren't doing a good enough job of convincing the people who were making the decisions but that doesn't mean that you lose it forever it might mean You find a different way or you shelve it and you come back to it. But we never forgot that idea. And actually, in the meantime, we published a really short book that was an illustrated book about confidence gremlins um, that we did ourselves just to practice, practice some of the writing. Did we enjoy it? Um, Made it all happen? Yeah, worked with an illustrator. And so we found a different way to do something connected. And I, I, I think that we wouldn't have got to Squiggly if we'd not persevered with that and kept developing our strengths and and our skills but things don't have to work out the first time to still believe that that's a direction that's interesting for you to keep exploring yeah i think is that's in reference to what you were talking about earlier in the sense that um you have to have this idea of where you're going Mm. it's not so much a finish point but a trajectory that's that's what i like that's how i like to describe it in the sense of setting goals in the sense of okay, you don't want to do X, you don't want to get X title, you want to be this type of person. Yeah. And that's what you're working towards. And I think that's what you're referencing in the book when you're saying flexibility. Mm. And it's not because new opportunities might come up might that might be grander than what you had in mind. And it's remaining flexible to that. Yeah, I think that's a perfect way of describing it. I think now will be a great time to talk about values, because I think it's something that it's so difficult to create and define ourselves. I think when you say to someone who doesn't have a set value structure, what are your values? They're almost like, oh my God, what are my values? Yeah. Kind of so what's the best way to define these values ourselves and, and to perhaps create our own value structure? Yeah, I think values can feel really intimidating and overwhelming as a topic. Yeah. And also we hear people talk about them a lot. So I was listening to a podcast this morning and someone was like, it's really important, you know, about your values. And, I, and so people say it a lot, but often don't talk about values in a very practical way. And I think yeah. we've got to get when something is naturally quite abstract and potentially a bit scary. I think the answer to that is to get really practical for people yeah. about thinking about your values. I see values as just they're the things that motivate and drive you. They're what makes you you. They're your DNA of kind of who you are. Um, And I think our values, we know our values are formed all kind of through our childhood. And they're sort of there as we become adults. It's just they're kind of hidden. Uh, You know, we sort of don't know them. We're not conscious of often what those values are. And when we do know them, I always describe it as they're sort of they act a bit like a career compass. I think they help you to make decisions 
they give you a kind of lens to look at your choices and they give you confidence that you are doing the right things for you versus what you should do, what other people think you should do. So how do you start working out what your values might be? And again, a bit like strengths, never see this as a process where you're like, oh, I've ticked off my values now because it actually does. I think you can make a lot of progress quite quickly. There's lots of clues on your values that you can get to, you know, even listening to this. But then really, it's about continually coming back to them and thinking about them for years. There's one of my values that took me a good four or five years to really realize that it that it was a value. I think a useful question, three useful questions to start with for people if you're thinking about your values for the first time is what's most important to you questions. So what's most important to you about what you work on, about who you work with and about where you work. And now you don't have work values and personal values. You just have your values. But as we're talking about a work and career context today, that's useful. They're just useful questions to start with. And everybody, I promise you, everybody answers those questions in very different ways. So if you and I started to answer those questions, sometimes again, we assume, well, doesn't everybody say the same thing? But people don't. People answer those questions in very different ways. So that can be kind of quite a helpful exercise to just start thinking about what really motivates and drives me. The other exercise that I would do alongside this, which is a great thing to do if you've got half an hour over a cup of tea, if you can head to a cafe and sort of sit by yourself for a while, is do a career graph of all of the ups and the downs of your career so far. So draw your own squiggly line. And once you've done that, and it could be a really long line if you've got 20, 30 years of experience, or perhaps you've been working for two years and it's a little bit shorter, but kind of map the highs and the lows. And then really look at the really high moments and the really low moments, because that's where we kind of have the most to learn. Those moments where things were going really, really well and those moments where things were really, really tough. And try and think about, you know, what can you learn from those moments? Because usually when things are going really well, it's because our values are present in the work that we're doing. Like you can you can start to spot, oh, it's because this is really important to me. It motivates and drives me. And it was there. It was kind of part of that organisation. It was part of that role. And in those low moments, it's often because either our values are missing, that they're just kind of not there, or they're being um, kind of contradicted or they're kind of in conflict. So there's something that's really important to you that the role or the organisation that you're in um, kind of has a very different perspective. And that then feels like there's a real clash of values. And that's very, very hard to, and that's why those moments often kind of feel so low. So if you do that career graph, look at the highs, think about what can you learn from the highs, what can you learn from the lows? And actually that works for strengths and values because usually we're using our strengths and living our values or worrying about our weaknesses and missing our values in those low moments. Yeah. And then I think once you've got, you, I would just create a mind map of words, just literally get loads and loads of words, keep collecting words that feel like they are, what motivate and drive you, what's really important to you. Repeat the exercises a few times. For values, we find that the more you repeat the exercise, the better your awareness, the better your insights. So do them in different places. Make sure you're remembering this is about all of your life, not just your kind of work life. And then start to come back to it and think, which words am I really drawn to? What are the three or four words that I, if I sort of had to pick in all of these words, which are the ones that really sum up me and you're starting to make some trade-offs there that feels quite hard to do but once you've started to do that maybe you get to six maybe you get to four don't worry you can change your mind you know you've got that prerogative to keep coming back keep changing your mind but also start to think about what do those words mean to me because you and I could pick exactly the same word like one of my values for example is learning one of your values could also be learning. Right, what we so. might, yeah, I can imagine. I'll sort of, I'll hazard it a guess there. Yeah. Um, but what we both might mean by that could be really different. Or like I've got, um, my values are achievement, ideas, learning, and variety. And if I just say those words in isolation, you get some insight into me and, and what matters to me. But if I just give you an extra sentence about what I mean by that value, what does that word mean to me? That just helps you to understand even more about what matters to me. And it's often when we get into writing those definitions for ourselves that we figure out, have I got that word right? 
Is there another word that springs up because you're writing your definition that actually is the right word? For ages, I wasn't sure whether my value was learning or coaching. So I just sat with a kind of slash learning slash coaching. (laughs) And I, I didn't try and solve it. I didn't try and fix it too quickly. I just kept coming back to the two words and thinking, well, which one is it? Which one really feels right for me? What do they mean? And over time, I started to realize that it was it was much more about learning than it was about coaching. I think for me, learning did a better job of summing up the fact that I love to learn. I love to be surrounded by other people who love to learn. And I love to help other people to learn. Whereas coaching felt a bit more specific. Doesn't mean that that doesn't matter to me. It just I don't think it's fundamentally one of my one of my values. So it's the, the, the thing to really think about with values is it does take a lot of time and a bit of a bit of thinking you need to keep coming back to it but it is probably the singularly most transformational thing that you can do for your career because once you do know your values you kind of do have this compass and I think it gives you confidence you make better choices you build better relationships because understanding your own values helps you to understand other people better too and you've just really increased your self-awareness so it's there's a reason that everyone talks about values so much I just think We've got to help everybody to have a more practical perspective and process to really think about your values in a really kind of day-to-day way. Yeah, I think the process is really important. Yeah. I think you need to give people a step-by-step framework. And yeah. I know you do it in the book about going about creating those values um, for yourself and also saying to people that it does take time. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I need to establish my values. And they think they can just sit down for like an hour and just yeah. sit down on a piece of paper and they're like, we're done. Well, honestly, that's what I did. The first time I did Uh, values, that's exactly what I did. I was sitting in um, Barclays in Canary Wharf on the 24th floor of a 31 tower um, block. And I just thought, right, I just need to crack this. I just need to crack my values. I think they're important. Right, I'm going to go through a bit of a process. And all that I did was get one very small slice of words that represented a small part of me. And so I'd lost lots of the kind of richness and all of what made me me. I just had got, I think I'd just got four different words, essentially, that all meant achievement because I was in the middle of a work day and I was, you know, task focused. I was in that kind of moment. And so I remember sharing those with my manager at the time. And she said to me, she was like, oh, I'm really glad you're spending time on this. But I really think you should perhaps, you know, have another go at it think a bit more deeply and I, I think I was a bit frustrated in this show. I was like well I've I sort of wanted the well done you've you've done this yeah. one. and actually when you then step back and then I started I remember doing it again just sitting by myself in a coffee shop at a weekend and suddenly came up with loads of different words and I was like what's just happened to me I feel like I'm like Jekyll and Hyde but it's not it's just because we all have lots of different parts of us and it is a bit of a process to kind of figure out those what are those core values? That's the thing that we're really trying to get to here. Those core values that are part of all of your life, not just kind of one part. So don't they make that mistake that I made and, and do that thing of I'm going to sit down and sort this out uh, in the next hour because that is that will not get you to really useful answers. But you can, like I say, you can, people shouldn't feel like it's um, this massive process that you can't make progress on because you can. I think if you every week to, did 20 minutes for a couple of weeks you'd make some really good progress maybe then leave it for a bit then come back to it you know a couple of 20 minutes keep coming back to it talk to some other people about it then I think you really start to get some meaningful kind of answers and outcomes that you can do something with and also your experiences define your value sometimes as well because you put yourself in positions where your values might become out of them like you yeah. might make an action or you might get some feedback and then you'd be like, oh, that actually matches to what I was thinking about when it in reference to my values. So I think sometimes taking the time is good because you have that reference in the back of your mind yeah. that you're looking to do this, but then you're acting out through experience, which is then reinforcing it or changing it based yeah. on, on things that are happening. I really like that. That's essentially what you've kind of described as you go, well, once you've got some, some sort of kind of food for thought, you start stress testing you start stress testing your thinking against your experiences. And as I said to you, I think I only realized one of my values quite late on in my career. I'd got three that I was really confident and comfortable in and was using regularly and had stress tested and felt really good about. And it was only later in my career, and this is probably 
four years ago, so quite recently, where one of my values had actually always been present and I'd not really noticed it, and that was variety. And suddenly that variety was taken away from my life and, and, and my world kind of got a lot smaller very quickly. Um, and actually I suddenly realised, I was like, oh, I hadn't quite noticed it. And I, exactly as you described, I had a new experience that meant I didn't have that variety and that really helped me to figure out because that was kind of one of those low moments. And it wasn't a low career moment. It was more of a low in my life. Back to this, it's about the whole person thing. Um, yeah. And it was going, oh, okay, actually, variety is one of those things where maybe it doesn't sound very glamorous. And perhaps it doesn't sound like one of those things that you think is a value. But it is really, really fundamental to me and who I am at work and in my kind of all my rest of my life. So it was only four years ago that I figured out that kind of final value that makes up my four core values. And, you know, we in our business, every quarter, both Helen and I share with each other how are we doing on our values. That's one of our KPIs. It's one of the ways that we um, when people join our company, we we introduce each other uh, to, to each other. It's like using our values. It's conversations that we have really regularly because I think you've got to keep it alive and it's got that's how you make it really useful is you know because these things change all of the time you know are you are you red amber green on each of your values at the moment in all aspects of your life and if you're in amber or red that's then a really useful positive prompt to think about well, what actions can I take to just add a bit more of that value kind of back into my world yeah, get that impetus and, and that motivation yeah. back, definitely. Um, I think a, a great place to perhaps end this conversation would be around future proofing, because I think the last 18 months has been um, quite a, a journey for many people, whether they're starting a new career, uh, whether that by choice or by circumstance. Um, I think a lot of people are thinking about how they can design their ideal career. Um, I think it would be great for to talk about some of the tactics that people can use to perhaps future proof themselves to to a degree and mm -hmm. and how they can build that. I think I mean, the World Economic Forum uh, recently did a report where they said 40 percent of the skills that we have right now won't be relevant in two years time, which feels really scary. Um, mm -hmm. and you could feel quite quite overwhelming. But I think the other way to look at that, the more positive way to look at that is. I think the fundamental thing that we are all going to need is the ability to kind of unlearn and relearn, to continually learn. And for many of us, and this has certainly been the case for me, we've sort of had to learn how to learn because I learned in an education system that was very structured. And I don't think I really learned to learn. I think I learned how to pass some exams along the way. And then I kind of went to work in this ladder like world where I was told what to do and existed in this kind of command and control environment and I feel like probably over the past five or six years I've really had to then challenge myself to think about well, what do I really mean when I mean learning so sometimes that means being a beginner again starting from scratch which is hard but our brains we know our brains have got neuroplasticity we know they can grow and learn new things and grow in different directions so I would encourage everybody if you're thinking about future proofing yourself I think continually thinking about what are the new things that I need to learn and thinking about how am I going to stretch my strengths so this thing about don't try and be all things to all people keep stretching those strengths that's what you yeah. will that's what people will recruit you for that's what people will um you know say about you that's what you're going to build your reputation for and just really thinking about how do you stay intentionally curious I sort of hope that's the area that I hope there's going to be lots more books and podcasts about in the next couple of years, because I think curiosity, again, is one of those things that we often lose in our careers, or perhaps we wait for it to happen to us rather than create it, these kind of moments of curiosity for ourselves. And so if you are staying really curious, if you're reading, watching, listening to things like this today, if you are taking ownership and control of your own development, not letting your development be dependent on other people. We talk about this idea of curate your own curriculum, figure out like what do you want to learn? How do you want to learn? How do you learn best? Some people love reading stuff, watching stuff. For some people, reading our book would be the last way they want to learn. That's, yeah. they don't want to do, you know, our book is quite an interactive book. I think I remember you saying in your review, you're like, You've got to be someone who quite likes like scribbling in a book. Um, yeah. You know, it's not an academic read, certainly. So so figure out like, well, what does work for you? And then and then make sure that you're kind of really thinking about how do I keep making time for my own learning, for my own development? Because I think too often 
we do put ourselves at the bottom of our own to-do lists. And then that can mean that in 12 months' time, in 18 months' time, you suddenly realise you've not really been stretching your strengths, you've not learned anything new, you can't remember the last time you took some time to be curious about some new things that you're intrigued and you're interested by. And the only person that's going to suffer from that is you, because no one should care about your career more than you do. And it's I know that's it's hard for people because people are busy and under lots of pressure but that would be the the final thing I'd really want to encourage everybody watching or listening to do is take ownership for your own learning and development uh, because it will stand you in really really good stead in the coming years yeah definitely and I like how you said curiosity because that was one of my values ah you said you said you said learning um was one of yours and I I had learning and curiosity on Uh the same time and I thought wait I kind of mm-hmm. both of them there because I feel like for me personally is my learning is driven by my curiosity mm. and curiosity drives this, this podcast, speaking with authors, it drives me learning new things. It just drives a lot of things that, that level of curiosity. So yeah, I'm so happy you mentioned that. And, mm-hmm. and I'm so happy that you've taken the time to speak with us about your book. And I think there's a lot that individuals can learn um, about themselves, but also their career from the book. So thank you for taking the time. Um, I really appreciate it. Where's the best place that people can find you online, whether it be a website or, or social media? Um, so we're at Amazing If on Instagram. Um, you can connect with Helen or I directly on things like LinkedIn. And we're just amazingif.com. Um, that's our website. And Squiggly Careers is our podcast. Um, it's a completely free podcast. Um, there's no paywalls. And we've got 211 episodes Um, hopefully on all things work. So um, if there is a topic that we've not covered that you'd like us to get in touch because we always need new ideas, but whether it's things like possibilities, strengths, values, all the things that we've talked about today and we've done a podcast episode on. So um, I always feel like if probably if they've enjoyed listening to you and all your brilliant conversations with authors, um, maybe that would be an extra helpful resource. Definitely. I definitely recommend checking out. I've checked out a couple of episodes anyway, so definitely definitely recommend that. Thank you, Sarah, for taking the time. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Also, visit our website www.booktalktoday.com to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine. Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value-packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today, for readers, by readers.